Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 5 of Footmarks, in which I, Behram Kazi, talk to Jared Kimber about his work. And today's topic, of course, is David Warner and how he requires room in order to play optimally as an international cricketer and opener. So, Jared, before we even get into the number crunching of things, right, I just want to talk to you about how Stuart Broad has now dismissed David Warner for the 15th time in Test cricket. Now, the record. Uh, for a dismissal by a bowler versus a particular batter in Test cricket is 18. Alec Betzer, another Englishman, tormented Aussie Arthur Morris back in the day. So they could, well, Broad could potentially break this record by getting Warner a few more times in the Ashes series because we're only in the first Test. So do you think that might happen? I kind of think that if he gets him two or three more times, that Warner will probably get dropped because... Hmm. If that's the case, I would think it would probably be new ball versus Warner and he would fail and so they would move him on. So, no, I don't think he will break the record just because of that. I think it's, it's possible, but I think it's unlikely. All right, well, in the first innings at Edgbaston, we came across perhaps the weirdest or worst and ugliest dismissal of uh, Warner ever versus Broad. And we have a sample size of 15, so that is a very strong claim, but... What it reminded me of, or, or what I thought when I saw it, was like an old lady was trying to whip away a rat with a stick, but then fell on the stick, and it just looked very, very ugly. So do you think that, given the fact that Warner doesn't get a lot of room these days to play on the offside, he was tempted by the apparent room that he thought he had, whereas that ball was nipping in by Stuart Broad, Broad back into the stumps, and that's why David Warner dragged it on or played it on and onto his stumps. Do you think that, you know, just looking at that apparent room maybe clouded his judgment and he didn't really look that the ball was nipping in? Yeah, I mean, I think it was a wobble ball, so he wouldn't have been able to tell mm. it was whipping in. And it uh-huh. came back a long way, to be fair to him as mm. well. Um, I think he thought he saw a wide ball and probably latched onto it a little bit early you know he said uh recently that you know that's that was one thing he was going to do he was going to take the balls that were on offer and and score off them especially through the covers a lot more and I think he really did believe that and he was trying Mm -hmm. to do that in that case but I think he kind of got mixed up between a traditional sort of slash uh down on one knee slash Mm -hmm. and then when the ball comes back in he sort of didn't play either of those shots and you know just ended up throwing the batter I mean it was uh, uh, a terrible, terrible shot. I remember being, I was on commentary and it was myself, I um, can't remember who the commentator was. I can't, it might have been uh, no, Daniel Norcross or Adam Collins. I can't remember who was on, but Jeremy Coney was on. And so when you do commentary on the radio and there's two experts, when something like that happens, you want to be the person who talks about it after you've seen the replay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Because it's a hard thing to explain. Because my first yeah. thing was, did he try and sweep that? Because his leg went down. <laughs> Yeah, And I remember having to call it and looking at Jeremy, who was looking at the screen, trying to work out what had happened while I was trying <laughs> to do it in, in live time. And uh, Isha Guha came up to me the next day and said, oh, it was a great call to David Warner. And I was like, I cannot believe the, that I pulled that off because that's, that's not how it felt going on in my head. And it was such a bizarre shot. But yeah, I do think that he, he really wanted to capitalize on scoring through covers and that when he thought he saw some width, he went for it. That the seam movement is probably why the shot looked as bad as it was. But I don't really think there was as much room there as he wanted. And that the reason for that is just because Broad comes from so wide on the crease. Yeah, that he does. And he just has more wood over David Warner now. And I'm really keen to see how this battle progresses. But anyway, let's get into some data now. Now, you mentioned that when David Warner made his test debut back in 2011... Only 20% of all deliveries bowled by right-handed bowlers to left-handed batters were from around the wicket. Now, that number has specifically, you know, uh, particularly spiked up as last year's numbers suggest that out of the 60, or oh, well, 60% of all deliveries bowled by right-handers to left-handers were from that angle around the wicket. So I want to talk to you about the bowler's perspective over here. Like, what has changed from their perspective and angle, and why do you think that number has risen as much as it has? There's actually just a bunch of reasons. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I didn't get into it as much in this piece before because I have written about it um, Mm -hmm. a little bit before. But essentially, we we were an outswing um, bowl-dependent game for a very Mm -hmm. long time. So the majority of the bowlers that bowled seam, and we're talking about seamers here, not spinners, obviously, but Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the the seamers who, who bowled in cricket uh, would bowl outswing, right? The right armers. 
And if you're bowling out swing, you want to bowl from over the wicket to left-handers because you want to pitch mm-hmm. the ball on middle and, and off stump and straighten it and try and get your LBWs. We don't really have outswing bowlers anymore. Jimmy Anderson and Tin Southey were two of the last ones, and they're both wobble ball bowlers now. Uh, we have a lot more bowlers who bowl in swing, uh, but mostly it's either wobble ball or just traditional seam bowling. And because of that, you don't have to bowl um, over the wicket. The other changes as well is the fact that with DRS, we understand LBWs with left-handers a lot more. So mm-hmm. I do think that's a big part of it. But I also think that traditionally it was thought of as the wrong tactic as a defensive tactic or something that you did when the left-hander was already smashing the ball but there were signs through you know glenn mcgrath um, bowling to brian lara you know uh, flint off to adam gilchrist and andre nell i think is a really andre nell is a really important person in cricket for this because i think he was one of the bowlers who worked it out the quickest and then the next the next part of it is the analysts right the analysts then come along and we now have whether you bowled over the wicket or around the wicket. Before, we didn't even have that data, right? Mm. So now the analysts are saying, well, to this guy you bowl over and to this guy you bowl around. and You bowl better when you bowl around. I mean, you know, to give you a a point, I I was dealing with a bowler who was really struggling to left-handers in T20 cricket, and he only ever bowled over the wicket to them. And I went, Mm. have you tried around the wicket? (laughs) And what he said to me was really interesting. He said he didn't really know how to. So as an analyst, I had to pull him over to the coach and do that. And up until probably six years ago, bowlers, even when were, the team plan was to bowl around the wicket, if a bowler couldn't do it, they would just say, oh, well, he can't bowl around the wicket. Hmm. Now, there's no excuse. You are supposed to learn how to do it. You are supposed to go and find out you know, your method, you know, work with the coaches and everything else. Um, so now you would, you would probably, as a bowler, you would still think about what you're best at, mm-hmm. but... The big difference is that, you know, you, you would also know what the batter is not best at. And so you might get some bowlers who prefer to go over or around the wicket, but the majority of the time now you would at least try the thing that the other bat, the, the batter doesn't like. And, yeah, I think all those things really, really changed the way that bowlers bowl. And um, from that, I mean, if you think about it, I, I remember, it's a weird story, but you know, I was a leg spinner, but I remember mm-hmm. playing in a game where, I can't remember why. Uh, we might have had a couple of other leg spinners and uh, the captain sort of said to me, do you want to bowl some medium pace? And I was like, <laughs> okay. And we were play- I remember we were playing against the best batter in the competition. He was a lefty. And I bowled a couple of balls over the wicket and he just eased them away through point. And I was like, there's nothing I can do. I'm not fast enough. I don't do anything with the ball. So I just went around the wicket and basically just bowled very fast off cutters, right? Hmm. And I didn't really know what I was doing. It was just a natural thing to do. And suddenly, the best batter in the competition, I beat him like two, in, two out of three balls. Mm. And every time I would bowl in the nets to any of my left-handed friends, I would just bowl around the wicket, a couple of straight ones, and then a couple of cutters. That angle is so brutal that if you can get the ball to straighten even a little bit, um, it's huge. And you think about all the great bowlers who have a natural in-swinger or a natural off-cutter who've been bowling from over the wicket. Well, it's much harder if the ball is coming in at you and then straightening or even leaving you to hit it because we know that because that's what off spinners do to to left handers and that's what left arm finger spinners do to right handers. So it's obviously a much better angle from that perspective, and uh, you know it. I, there are so many reasons why it's come into the game, but it, it's a fascinating new part of it. Yeah, and if I really think about it, you know, if I go back, obviously I wasn't alive back then. I was born in '94, and Pakistan won the World Cup in '92, but. This is very similar to what Wasim Akram did to Alan Lamb, right? He yep. moved it away and got top of off. And that's just pretty much what these right-handed bowlers are now trying to do to lefties. It's just role reversal. Uh, mm-hmm. they, they, the, the right-hander is now a bowler and the left-hander is now a batter. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at now is that David Warner is a veteran of 105 test matches. He is not a newbie, not a new kid around the block. So why has it taken right-arm seamers so long to figure out that the best way to get David Warner out is to cramp him for room coming from the, or bowling from the other side. So you still have bowlers who don't like it. So we know that mm-hmm. Kemar Roach and, and uh, Stuart Broad are certainly two that absolutely love coming around the wicket. But Mohamed Siraj, for instance, doesn't like coming around the wicket, right? He'd mm-hmm. much rather come over the wicket. And, and there's still a few of those bowlers out there. So you've got to remember that that is a thing. Right, you know what you're comfortable with. You know we see Jimmy Anderson in this test match bowling around the wicket. Oh, I said this test match, yeah. Whenever you're listening <laughs> to the full marks, but the, the recent Ashes test match, bowling around the wicket to Usman Khawaja and to Travis Head and to Alex Carey, despite the fact that they like it, but he likes it. So you've got to factor in that. The other thing is that the 
the kind of data that we're talking about took a long time um, to, to come up with, right? It's not particularly something that... I think we started noticing this trend in 2019, um, but it probably starts around 27, 20, uh, t- 2017, 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, Warner was out of the game for a little while around that time as well, yeah. uh, if you remember. <laughs> I can't remember what happened. He took a sabbatical. Let's just say he took a sabbatical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Went so to the I beach, think, played with some sand. That's the story. Yep. <laughs> played in Canada. Um, so so I think I, I think... From that perspective, all those things were happening. I think, uh, especially a lot of the smaller teams, don't, they didn't have all this information, right? You know, mm-hmm. not everyone has even the information that I have available to them. More, right. Most teams now do, but they didn't in 2018, 2019. So I do think that's all a part of it. But as I said, the, the default was bowling over the wicket. It was seen as a negative thing to do to come around the wicket. Hmm. And the other thing that I would add that, that I think is really important is because you started over the wicket, quite often when you would bowl around the wicket to someone like David Warner, it would be when he was set. Hmm. That's not what is causing the modern left-handers the problems. What is causing them the problems is the new ball coming around the hmm. wicket because that's the one most likely to have lateral movement. And, and I do think from that perspective uh, that it probably did take a little bit longer for everyone to catch on. But yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the most... Um, I, don't, I think by 2019... Kemar Roach and Stuart Broad were doing so well. I think there was at one stage, Kemar Roach or something, over a two-year period, had a bowling average like 15 bowling around the wicket mm-hmm. to left-handers, right? Like he was just unplayable. And I think because him and Broad were so loud with it, it moved. But I don't necessarily think that the... You know, this is still not an analyst-led sport, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are a couple of teams in England, and certainly one of them, where the analysts have a big say. But in general, it's not an analyst-led sport. When you have your analyst telling you these things, and then you also see Kemar Roach destroying your left-handers or, or Stuart Broad or who, one of the other bowlers doing it, I think that's when things start to change. And I do believe that that played a big part in, in, the, in it getting more popular. And, and sometimes that's what it needs, right? It just needs one famous person to do it. It's interesting that you brought the analysts into it. And on that, I just want to go on a tangent. Of course, in your piece, you mentioned that most left-handers prefer when right-arm seamers bowl to them over the wicket. But there are a fair few left-handers who prefer right-arm seamers coming around the wicket. And incidentally, you know, you have three of those guys in the Australian team right now. You've got the Australian Test Cricketer of the Year, Usman Khwaja, who's also Centurion from the Edge Baston Test. And then you have Travis Head, the hero of the World Test Championship final, and Alex Carey, who is in phenomenal form, whether it be scoring runs or keeping wicket. And the interesting bit is that do England not have these sort of resources at their disposal? disposal? Because they bowled consistently to Khwaja, Head and Carey from over, uh, around the wicket, the right-arm seamers. And to their credit, they, well, Jimmy Anderson bowled an absolute jaffer to get rid of Carey in that first innings. And I think Ben Stokes pretty much manufactured the Khwaja dismissal with the field placements. But even though they got those two guys out from the same angle, do you think they've missed a trick or do you think the analysts probably need to look at these numbers or something? No, I think the analysts would know everything that I would mm-hmm. know and, and far more. So it wouldn't be the analysts. I, th- I think with the England bowls, they've come to a point where they bowl around the wicket so much, they feel much more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, it's a, what I find really interesting is that the three players who scored the most for Australia were the left-handers that they did bowl around the wicket to. Mm-hmm. I think that I think the bowlers were bowling to their strengths rather than bowling to the batter's weaknesses. Mm. And to be fair to England, it's not something they do that often. So I think mm. it's, you know, I'm not slagging them off because I think their bowlers are usually fairly clever at that sort of stuff. But yeah, I, I think they made a mistake and it'll be interesting to see throughout the rest of the Ashes if they actually move back um, uh, over the wicket a little bit more. I don't think Stuart Broad will, though. Uh, but... You know, uh, they did eventually get those guys out, but they would made so many runs by that point, it was different. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, I think the mistake was made, but it certainly wouldn't have been with the. An- I mean, I could be wrong. Now I'm trying to think. There was someone. There was another plan that I saw with Jimmy Anderson. Oh, the the Manus Labuschagne, uh mm-hmm. plan. That is clearly something that the analyst and the bowlers have come up with on, on their own. And they've really worked out that, you know, Manus pushes at full balls hmm. that are wide early on and that you, you, know, you have a chance of uh, nicking him off. I can't believe that they've gone to all that detail and then not looked at which <laughs> side of the wicket that you need to bowl to these other guys. I, I think with Usman, it was obvious. I think I worked that out before I even looked at the numbers. Yeah. Travis Head Siraj- used... 
Siraj struggled yeah. him so much in the World Test Championship final, right? That was proof enough. Well, it's just, it, it's the way, the Siraj thing is part of it, but it's also just the way he bats because when he doesn't move his feet a long way mm. and, uh, you know, if, if you do, he moves his hands a lot. When the ball's coming towards him, he can keep his hands under his eyes. When the ball's going away from him, when someone's bowling over the wicket, his hands sort of follow the ball out. So I, I always thought that was that the thing with him. I remember when Travis Head in 2019 actually was terrible at it. So he's changed his batting a little bit. Mm. And that comes to the whole thing that David Warner talked to me about when I interviewed him, which was, you know, that Duckett and Travis Head are getting very, very good at finding ways to make space. But as we saw in this test match, uh, Ben Duckett tried to do that twice and, and still nicked off. So it's it's a... I think there's a lot more risk in being a left-handed batter um, at the moment against right-arm seam than there has been in a long time. Yeah, and, uh, well, fun tangent. Now let's get back to Davey Warner. And he's been quite vocal about this, hasn't he? You were in that press conference or whatever his words were with respect to this challenge, and he's been quite honest about it. He said that, look, he does enjoy the room, and now he is being cramped, and he has to make his own room, which is a challenge, but also something that left-handers can do quite effectively. We've seen a lot of them do it. Ben Duckett also tried to do something similar when he was batting for England. But the problem over here is that David Warner... There's no point uh, of him talking to Southpaws of yesteryear because they never faced this problem. He's only getting to face this problem now because the numbers have increased now. So do you think there's anything else that Warner can do apart from, you know, consulting right-handed batters of what they do when the ball moves away from them? Or is this, you know, a roadblock and he just cannot get past it? So there's some really interesting stuff that you said in there. So one thing that you said was that uh, he can't consult the left-handers of yesteryear. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting because this is something that commentators... It, it's, you know when you hear a commentator and they go, they should just bowl more Yorkers, right? And then you talk to a death bowler and you go, why don't you bowl more Yorkers? And they take you through it step by step why it doesn't work, right? Mm. It's the same with left-handers when they, they, they you know, you, you talk to these left-handers and be like, oh, I never had any problem with bowlers bowling around the wicket to me. And I, was, and I was like, yeah, but you were facing it when you were 60 and mm. there wasn't a wobble ball and DRS wasn't an issue, right? You weren't going to be out LBW if someone was coming yeah. around the wicket to you because the umpire would say the angle was no good. All those things have changed. Mm. And, and KP talked about it uh, when he talked about spin today when, you know, Andy Flower would say to the guys, come on, you've got to get better at playing spin. And they were like, Andy, when you played spin, you padded away half the balls you faced, right? <laughs> No one could do that anymore. So the game has changed so dramatically. What I found interesting about Warner was he was talking to right-handers, which hadn't even occurred to me yeah. that, that he would do that. And he was going to right-handers and specifically saying that um, I need to work out how to cover my off stump better, which is not something that left-handers had to worry about traditionally. So I do think that you can improve a little bit there. But the honest truth is, Bayram, that I would assume all the way through cricket, this is now happening. I like, mm -hmm. don't think this is just happening in test level or international level or first class level. So even in club cricket, bowlers are bowling around the wicket a lot more. What, what that means is everyone is going to learn how to do it. I don't think it's an unplayable hmm. art form, right? Bowling right arm seam around the wicket to a left-hander. What I do believe is that over a period of time, people will get better at it as they get to face it more. It should be, if it's, if it's working perfectly or... If it's working better, we should get to a point where about 50% of left-handers like it on one side and 50% of the left-handers like it on the other side, right? That, mm. that, would, be, that would mean that we, we, we could work out that it's working pretty well. At the moment, that's not the case. It's a, I think it's about seven on one side and about mm -hmm. 28 on the other side, right? Mm. A and I think over a period of time, you would learn just because you are facing a lot more of it. I mean, we're seeing people learn the wobble ball in real time as, as well, you know? We saw players learn how to face reverse swing in the 90s mm. and the deuce and all these different balls that come about. If you face them a lot, you can come up with a plan. If you haven't faced it a lot and you're trying to work it out, what I would say for David Warner is it's probably too late, right? Mm. He might be able to get some form and make some runs in this particular series or in his last test series, but I don't think he's ever going to be as good a player when they're bowling around the wicket as he is over the wicket just because he's old, right? He, you yeah. know, he doesn't have the time to do that. Whereas Travis Head, as I said, he's had that turnaround already. Mm -hmm. And I know that was a big thing. I mean, there, as at one stage, you basically only had to come around the wicket to Travis Head and he couldn't play you. And now he's stronger when people bowl around the wicket uh, uh, than when they bowl over the wicket. It is possible to conquer this thing. But I think in future, um, left-handers will just be more used to it. Yeah, that's a very fascinating point that you bring up because time is not on David Warner's side and he has 
lost a bit of appetite for test cricket as well like he's been vocal about how he wants to play his final test or wishes to play his final test versus pakistan at the scg scg when uh, pakistan tour australia but i think the biggest takeaway over here is the muscle memory that he's built over the years and he's just yeah. been so used to freeing up his arms and cutting anything and everything that's uh, you know bold at some width so i think that might be his biggest challenge now Another data centric thing that you mentioned in your piece was that left-handers traditionally or in the previous generation have outperformed the, their right-handed counterparts when it comes to batters and this also could be partly because of uh, the LBW laws and DRS coming into the picture but then you also showed some data where they still outperform outperform right-handers right because the averages have gone down for both uh, so mm. even though left-handers have taken a hit they're still performing better than right-handers and this couldn't possibly be proof right that lefties are just better at batting <laughs> It, it, it's a huge advantage. I know Ian Higgins from um, The Great mm. Cricketer uh, on, on one of his podcasts once basically said that it's an unfair advantage if you bat left-handed. Mm. And, and there are sports where it's not particularly an advantage, right? And there are mm. some sports where you, you can't, you know, my son's a left-hander and he struggles with certain things in sport. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's violinists as well. Is violin, mm. you have to use your right hand. I don't think there's any left-handed violinists. So the, all these sorts of weird things that happen. <laughs> so it's not always an advantage. But I think in cricket, it was certainly a big advantage. And uh, I think we all knew that because my, mm, uh, I, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but my memory is that 33% of batters at test level are left-handed. And certainly it is not 33% of the po uh, population that are left-handed. So mm. we know that there is an advantage there. Mm -hmm. And there are disadvantages in places. I would say in Asia, it's a disadvantage to be a left-hander because you're more likely to go up against a quality off-spinner on a pitch that will assist them. Whereas mm -hmm. in Australia, where off-spin is not particularly dominant, um, Australia has you know, the majority of left-handers. I'm old enough to remember when they said, oh, you can't open the batting with two left-handers in Australia. And then Langer and Hayden absolutely smashed everyone everywhere. And they went, oh, maybe you can. So I think there is an advantage with being a left-hander for the same reason that, you know, you talk about muscle memory before. So what's muscle mm -hmm. memory, right? It's basically brain elasticity, mm -hmm. right? Even if you play at the top level of cricket and you know that 33% are left-handers, that still means that two out of every three balls you bowl as, as, as any kind of bowler is going to be mm -hmm. to a right-hander. Right. Most bowlers should be better to right-handers unless they have a natural advantage, in, you know, an outswinger or maybe their angle or whatever that may be against, or, you know, just the, or an off-spinner against left-handers. But most bowlers should be better against right-handers just because they have got chosen. You know, they got picked for their nation because they are a... a um, uh, they're good against right-handers. In club cricket, they would have faced more right-handers. In junior cricket, they would have faced more right-handers. In school cricket, every step of the way, they would have faced more. And so I think from that perspective, it does make a lot of sense. And there are a lot of very good bowlers in the world mm -hmm. who don't particularly like bowling to left-handers. There mm -hmm. really aren't many left-handed specialist bowlers just because that's a much harder thing to be because mm -hmm. there aren't as many out there. Yeah, I mean, so maybe definitive evidence, not so much, but a definite advantage for left-handers in certain conditions but here's an afterthought now Usman Khwaja who is Davy Warner's longtime mate and also partner when opening the batting for Australia now Khwaja pulls the ball really well even if it's like a fraction short or a length delivery he goes for it he goes for the pull he gets tons of runs on it David Warner is also a very good puller of the ball you know he can really have a crack at it and we've seen him do that in this edge baston test as well could that not be something he could, you know, employ versus the wobble ball when the right arm seamer is coming from around the wicket? Yeah, I, I just think that if you go through the history of David Warner, he basically has kind of, he, he basically wants to hit through point, backward point, mm. you know, um, cover point, th those kinds of areas. And he wants that width. The shot that you're talking about in edge baston is obviously makes a lot of sense that, you know, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of bounce on that particular wicket. And we've seen Usman Khawaja pulling off the stumps and you know mm -hmm. that's not a normal t especially in England but yeah. kind of anywhere out even out even in Asia you wouldn't play that shot that often Warner used to have this shot that was like a tuck shot that he played mm -hmm. a lot in Australia uh, but he likes to play that when it's under his eyes mm -hmm. I think we saw the pull shot come out more in his second inning at, at Edgebaston right mm -hmm. whether he'll be able to do that when the wicket has more pace and bounce mm -hmm. I doubt but perhaps on certain wickets, that might be something that he does. Uh, but the, the other thing is that if he knows that the angle is coming back in, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
he's trying to score very square of the wicket because that's where he wants to. In this wobble ball era, outside of a few key players, a lot of the players that I've talked to have basically been trying to hit the ball very straight. Mm-hmm. And the reason they're trying to hit it very straight is to make sure that they have as much a bat face as possible on the ball um, and that they don't overcommit um, too much to you know trying to hit it through point or trying to hit it through square leg or anything like that. I think that's another option. Uh, of mm-hmm. just punching the ball back down the ground. Um, but, I mean, you, you, let's say I'm right or you're right with either of mm-hmm. those things. He's still most dangerous when he's got the width and he's going to be able to score. Mm-hmm. And by taking that width away, you take away one of David Warner's main skills, which is scoring quickly off you. Yeah. Now, that frustrates him. And I also don't think he feels comfortable defending for a long period of time this particular line so you there's a lot of things that you are taking away from him the other thing i would say is that when you're bowling over the wicket chances are you are a little bit straight and he was a master at just dropping the ball on the leg side and scoring off you if you're bowling around the wicket and you're keeping the ball outside the off stump but coming into off stump he's going to feel a little bit less comfortable about playing that shot so what you should be doing in this situation is taking away his chance to hit two and three falls in a row on the offside and also taking away his chance of rotating the strike whenever he wants to. So even if he got that pull shot in, he's still going to be in a point. So uh, Warner's, Warner's ability to hit multiple boundaries in a row puts you under pressure. But he's the, one of the reasons he's such a good test player is his ability to get off strike. I think the, mm. the, that angle affects both of those skills. Uh-huh. Well, I can't believe I'm going to quote or, or mention Zach Crawley over here, but here's another guy who loves to drive the ball and, you know, play his strokes and everything. And even though he has a terrible record across 35, 36 test matches, however many they are, he did get runs in the first innings over here. And he, the, the hallmark of that innings, or why it was successful for a while, was that he had soft hands or played with soft hands, so his edges weren't really flying to the slip fielders, and he was employing the baz ball shuffle. So could that technique potentially work for David Warner? I know Crawley's a right-hander, but David Warner does not play with soft hands, does he? No, I mean, I, it, uh, Crawley's the opposite of Warner in every way, right? He's hmm. a foot and a half taller, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, he's a, and he's a right-hander, and he likes a big step down the wicket. But your, mm-hmm. your, your point is also really interesting because Warner has started to use the crease a little bit more. Mm-hmm. That is an interesting one because we're seeing players all around the world do that. And mm-hmm. if he can manage to use that crease a little bit more, uh, that means that they can't just bowl that back of a, or not even back of a length to him, almost like a length delivery to him outside off yeah. stump uh, and keep him in that position. Batting on off stump is something that, you know, he has tried before and hasn't particularly worked. But it, batting on off stump kind of gives the bowler a big advantage. If you look at what um, Tom Latham did, uh, he would walk outside the stumps sometimes when people would attack him from that angle, which meant that Mm -hmm. suddenly the ball was, in his mind, on his off stump. uh, Sorry, on his leg stump because he's moved across and he could just turn it onto the leg side. There are little things like that that Warner Mm -hmm. could do. Um, He can't do what Crawley does specifically just because Crawley's massive. Um, Mm -hmm. But what he can do is perhaps what Ollie Pope does, which is Mm -hmm. every now and again take a couple of steps down the wicket and just say, okay, well, now I'm here. And I think that if you look at, maybe not Devin Conway, but some of the other left-handers, but Latham is the one that really comes to mind, that they're very good at getting outside the line, which means that Bold and LBW are less likely, and then it's Mm. just the court behind. It it feels like Warner doesn't want to do that, and Mm -hmm. I think he still wants to play his own way, even though he can't. And again, that might just be, you know, with, without wanting to age him, he's an older dude about to retire. He probably wants to do it his way. And to be fair to him, his career has been successful his way. Yeah, and I mean, I am, have always been a Davy Warner fan, even though he's tormented Pakistan 300 uh, in that he SCG has. or what test was that? I think it was the SCG or might have been the MCG, cannot quite recall. But then, of course, there was a T20 World Cup fi- uh, semi final. Uh, Warner was the player of the tournament in Australia's only T20 World Cup win. But we've did seen he not David make a Warner. lot of runs? Did he not make a lot of runs in UAE against Pakistan too? That's what I'm saying. The T20 World Cup uh, semi-final. No, 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 no. In oh, the um, in the, the test t- matches. In, I, because he's really did the other interesting thing about all, all this. Of course, is that Warner's really only ever had success in Australia, South mm-hmm. Africa, and I think the UAE against Pakistan mm-hmm. are the three places he's been most successful when touring. So, uh, you know, uh, well yeah. done to Pakistan and South Africa <laughs> for being on the on the wrong side of that. 
Yeah, I suppose so. And he's definitely been tormentor in chief for Pakistan. Steve Smith, not so much, but David Warner, definitely. And you see, when you look at David Warner, like step back, look at it from a macro lens, look at his entire career, he's gone through several transformations. Now, this was a guy who uh, people would say is not built for Test cricket, and here he is, 105 Test matches later, averaging over 40. He's built a decent career for himself, and he's definitely been one of the most prominent names in Australian cricket for the last decade. Now, this might be, you know, a little too late for him to figure out, but we've seen him even transform outside, you know, the field from the bull to the reverend. Mm. Do you think he has it in him to survive till that SCG test till Pakistan, or is this the last we're seeing of him in this ashes? It's a really good question. One thing I would say is that because... We're, we're, we're recording this during the Edge Baston test, so <laughs> it's after day four. But he's out. As it, Robinson has already gotten Warner, so that's all. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but what, what I was going to say is we don't, we don't know what the rest of the pitches are going to be like. We don't know if Anderson and Broad are going to kick up such a fuss that England go back to green tops. If they keep pitches like this, hmm. I don't think it's beyond the scale of possibility that he starts to make more runs. I, I've actually thought across his two test matches in England so far, mm -hmm. he's looked okay. I haven't sat there yeah. going, oh, he looks terrible. Um, the ball that he went out with in the second innings that Robinson got him for was, was a cross-seam ball that he edged behind. It was kind of a, mm -hmm. a surprise wicket. I thought he was batting really good at that point. I thought he batted yeah. really good at times uh, at the Oval against India as well. If the pitches continue like this, I wouldn't be surprised if he makes it through to the SCG. If the pitches have any life or he gets you know, thrown in on a couple of warnings against the England bowlers, I don't think it will take that long for... I, uh, maybe some of this depends on where how Australia is going in the series. Because remember, they kept him all the way through last time, despite the fact that um, uh, he didn't make any runs because they were yeah. still doing well in the series. They didn't have to make that decision. But I would, I would assume that if the pitches stay exactly like they are, he will make it to the end of the Ashes. But I think if there's any regression towards lateral movement, whether it be off the pitch or in the air, I don't think he makes it to, uh, I don't think he makes it to the SCG, no. And, and what about the fact that this is his last Ashes and he does, you know, intend to retire very soon? Does that, you know, free up his mind a bit? Is there less pressure? Does he play with more freedom? Maybe that's why he's playing, you know, decently in this innings? Or, well, decently is relative, but we expect it wanted to be much worse, right? Yeah, well, I, I suppose if you look at the pitches... Both of these pitch, not that they suited him. They haven't been exactly mm. David Warner pitches, but they haven't been the kind of England pitches that David Warner doesn't score on, uh, if, mm. if that makes sense. Um, look, I think there was le there is less pressure on him. I think you're mm -hmm. right there. If it's a t but I don't think it's a pressure thing. I think it's a technical mm. thing. And mm. so, yes, that will free him up. I, it wouldn't surprise me if he got away in one test just because he's David Warner and he could get away. But... England aren't going to allow him to be in a situation where he dictates. And mm. so it might be a slightly different kind of innings from that point of view. But that is the kind of innings he might be able to do where he's just like, wow, this is, this is one of my last knocks ever. I might as well, you know, do everything I can. Um, and I think that's where the lack of pressure doesn't matter. I don't think he's afraid of being... He wants to retire against... Pakistan at the SCG. Mm -hmm. You know, we've mentioned it multiple times in this podcast. He's mm. very clear on that. I don't think it's the end of the world to him if he doesn't, mm. right? That's probably a healthier mental position to be in, in a, you know, if you are going through a bit of a form slump, then, oh my God, uh, my whole career is going to end if I don't make the next run, right? So from that perspective, I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Um, and the mental pressure should help him. But at the end of the day, I do think it's a technical thing. And so, you know, the mental side is only one small part. Yeah, well, I'm sure like myself and many other viewers would be very, very keen to see how he fares versus Stuart Broad because if he loses his wicket to him, let's say, four more times in the next eight tests, I think Stuart Broad is looking at a lifetime supply of Marmite at the very least. That's definitely happening. But anyway, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> yeah, you were saying something. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, if you haven't seen the Marmite ad that Bayram's just talked about, Google it. It's, because I can't, I've watched the ad twice. Uh, have you seen the ad? Yeah. <laughs> I still can't work out if it's a good ad or not. I can't work out if it, if it's good. To be fair to Brody, I think his acting throughout the ad holds up. Mm. But um, yeah. I know I, I know one of the Barmy Army guys in it, the big guy with the muscles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I've, I've you know had some drinks with him before and met him a few times on tours. Uh, but it's a bizarre. It's a bizarre. <laughs> the, this is the thing. That, Stuart Broad has an ad where like where the rivalry with with David Warner is in it. What a 
remarkable thing of, of this. <laughs> this is a relationship that's going to la- well last beyond their careers. And, you know, doing this, the one thing I would just add just before we finish is that there were some people on this list. Like, my favorite one was Hugh Trumbull and Tom Hayward. So Tom Hayward was the best batter in the world in the, in the period in which he played. And Hugh Trumbull destroyed him. Absolutely, <laughs> utterly destroyed him. Uh, you know, and, and I, you know, the, there were some really good players. Did, will you say Arthur Morris and... Um, Alec Betzer. Al- I mean, again... Alec Bet's a fantastic bowler, but Arthur Morris, if you're dominating <laughs> Arthur Morris or David Warner, uh, but the other good thing, if you do have a look at the list of the, the guys who've got the, uh, the, the, someone out the most, just have a look at many times McGrath, Ambrose and Walsh come up. And I think it's because they also went up against a bunch of players who played for long periods of time. But I did wonder how many times, like if, if uh, Ambrose or Walsh didn't have the other one at the end, how many times they might have got some of those guys out. They might have been in the 30s uh, point <laughs> yeah. if they were on their own. Uh, but yeah, no, look, I think it, I, I'm really fascinated to see how Warren goes, but I'm also really fascinated to see how left hand is developed going mm. into the future. Definitely. And uh, just a little bit more on that list. I mean, we, we mentioned, you know, Hugh Trumbull and, and then the Betzer Morris rivalry or whatever. This one is the one that people will remember. Stuart Broad versus David Warner, just because it has all of that pop culture reference and it's in an advertisement for Marmite. And, and one other keen observation is that if you look at all the batters that Ambrose and Walsh and McGraw were getting out, Mike Atherton features a fair few times. If you're watching yes. the Atherton, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he is a staple over there. And I think they joke about that a lot in the com box as well. But yeah. I think we're all keen to see how left-hand is fair, in particular Broad versus uh, Warner. And, yeah, no, uh, I, I think it's a fascinating development in cricket. Mm-hmm. And I th- if you look at the last couple of years, obviously DRS and spin has been one and the wobble mm. ball has been another. I think this is the other major third one of, you know, these guys come in, you know, War- Warner is, I didn't get into it in the piece. And we'll finish up because I am exhausted and need to go to bed mm-hmm. in the middle of this. Yeah. But I di- the other thing is that sometimes you enter... Test cricket, and you're perfectly set up to dominate Test cricket, which David Warner was. And then Test cricket changes. And, and one mm. of my favourite ones of that, of course, is Shane Watson, who would have been taught yeah. as a young child, "You're a big, massive man. Take a big step down the wicket. No one's ever going to get you out, LBW." And mm. then poor old Watto runs into DRS, and his career <laughs> arc completely changes. And we know he was a quality batter, but we also know he never quite overcame that. And all these things are happening in real time, right? Mm. And 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 the. Counterpoint to that is Usman Khawaja comes back into the game when everyone's bowling around the wicket and it happens to be the yeah. thing he likes. Sometimes life just breaks your way. Yeah, and Usman Khawaja is averaging, what, 68 points something as an opener in test cricket, which is the most for any opener with minimum 25 innings. But yeah, that's a fantastic point you may make. And I think we'll end this podcast now because you have to sleep and I have to as well. But I'll end it on a note of, you know, free left-handers. Stop caging them. Right armers, bowl from over the wicket or something. That's not fair. <laughs> we love ourselves a left-hander. But anyway, thank you so much for your time, Jared. And I hope all the listeners enjoyed as well. We'll be back with episode six of Footmarks next week. Till then, that's all from us. Goodbye.